things can be turned around. I didn't want to live. Paul. Paul Considine, founder of Manchester's only alcohol-free bar, Love From. You've got to be comfortable with yourself and your own thoughts. We thought I'd be back drinking again by this summer. What is the big dream? Love From is more than a venue, a brand and a movement, and that's why our motto is cutting out isn't missing out. And I guess that's like more of a personal yeah, yeah. And what I've learned is... Welcome to another episode of the Anything Is Possible podcast. I'm so excited today. We're with Carl Considine, who is the founder of Manchester's only alcohol-free bar, and it is called Love From, which I love. Carl, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. Do you know, when I hear that, it's still because love from so new. Yeah. And yeah. when I like read it in something or when I hear it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's me. Oh, where did the name come from? That was one of my questions. Okay. I might as well ask okay. you now. So I used to host a podcast called What Next. Yeah. And What Next is uh, it's sharing people's stories of sobriety. Yeah. And um, it's quite it's quite intense. It's quite full on and it. Intentionally, it's like that because the first episode that I did was my story right. and my story is quite intense. Yeah. Um, and then since then, the guests that I've had on are people sharing real, like, difficult stories of life and of challenge and with addiction, but then how their life has turned around. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we get, like, a few listeners here and then. You can go on and you can check the stats and you can see, yeah, like, where yeah. people have listened in the world. And... It, it, I was getting listeners in Australia, in India, all over the place. I'm thinking, who are these people? Yeah. And then I get messages on Instagram. And I got a message from this girl and she said, it still gives me goosebumps when I talk oh. about it. Um, she was like, I've been listening to your podcast and I've had a problem with drinking for quite a long time. But I've struggled to, she struggled to talk about it openly with her yeah. friends. And it, it, there's a real stigma attached to mm. it, right? And whether your experience is addiction or not, mm -hmm. talking about drinking alcohol and the behaviour around it, mm. it's quite a taboo topic. Yeah. And I think it makes people go it, like a yeah. bit inwards. It, it's yeah. a bit uncomfortable, right? Um, so she'd not been talking to anyone about it. Um, and she listened to my first episode and then she said over the next couple of days, she listened to every episode. Yeah, when you like backtrack it because you like it so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She binge watched my, binge yeah. listened my podcast. Yeah. Um, and she said it had changed her life. She was wow. like, I just want to let you know that it has completely changed my perspective on everything. And she stopped drinking as a result of it. And she signed it off. She didn't put her name, but at the bottom she signed it off, Love from Lisbon. Oh, wow. And I was like, at the time I was, it was just when I was setting up the bar and I was trying to think of a name for the bar. And the names that I were coming up with were um, things like Free Spirit yeah. and um, like Zero Bar. Yeah, or still a cool. AF Bar and, you know, yeah. all quite literal things. Yeah. And ugh, they just didn't mean anything to yeah. me. Like I was like, oh. Mm. Maybe people might connect with it and it's really yeah. clear like what it is, but it doesn't feel like it means anything yeah. to me. And I got that message on one of the days when I was thinking about this and I needed to have the branding done so that I could get everything signed off for the menus yeah. and all that. Basically, I had a deadline yeah. and it was like a gift that came essentially because yeah. then I read this message and as soon as I read Love From Lisbon, I was like, Love From, yeah. I'm going to call it Love From because that essentially, her experience... I've set up the business for a reason and because of my own experience and because yeah. I want to help other people. And I just read that and thought, oh, wow, that's oh. perfect. I was like, I can't call it Love From Lisbon, but I'll call it does Love From. Does she know? I don't know if she does. Or would you no. be able to find her message and let her know? Do you yeah, think? You definitely should. I should, yeah. Oh, you I definitely should. should. You need to do that. Yeah, because yeah. I, I also thought maybe the Lisbon thing, maybe if it goes well mm -hmm. and I end up having bars in different places which you will <laughs> which i will hopefully um i can set up uh, a name attached oh, to each yeah. love from so you know oh, 
Manchester could be love from Little Manchester. Little postcards. Or, oh, I love that. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Oh, well, you've segued us so nicely. Such an easy guest already. Um, <laughs> into your story. Okay. Um, you know, I actually was saying to the team before we started, what would you want to know from this guy? And they said, I feel like there's a story behind somebody mm. setting up a bar like that, an mm. alcohol-free bar, and I'd love to know that. So I know that you are comfortable to share your story. So I'd, I'd love to hear where it all started. Yeah, so I'm three years sober. So uh, yeah, January 2021, mm -hmm. I stopped drinking. And I always say to people like, uh, right out the gate, it, I stopped drinking because I had to. Mm -hmm. Alcohol was, or had become really problematic for me. Yeah. And it was kind of a slow progressive thing. So. Mm -hmm. In my friendship group, kind of growing up, I was always the person in the group that was the party boy. Mm -hmm. I would always want to stay out the latest. The lights <laughs> would come up at the club, you know, the party's ending, and I just wouldn't want to go home. And mm -hmm. there was a time in my life where, like, that was fine because, you know, I was in my 20s. There yeah. were no negative consequences, really. It was, and also that's what a lot of young people do, right? Yeah. And I'd moved to, like, I've lived in Leeds, I've lived in London, then I moved to Manchester. I spent most of my adult life in Manchester. And that's just kind of how you connect with people when you move to a city. Mm. And as a gay person coming to Manchester, wanting to, like, find the broader queer community, yeah. you know, places like Canal Street are a dream because yeah, you scene. go out and that's yeah. where the scene is and you party. And mm. so, it, yeah, I'm quite careful to say I've had some amazing times yeah. in my yeah. um, drinking career, yeah. so to speak, but it got bad. It got mm -hmm. bad and progressively and very slowly, it started to impact things in my life, mm -hmm. important things such as relationships, um, my connection with my family and my friends, yeah. um, money. I got into a lot of debt, yeah. um, work. I really struggled to not just hold down a job, but my priority became drinking. Mm -hmm. That's all I cared about. Mm -hmm. So I'd be in work Monday to Friday, always did office jobs, and I'd be living for the weekend. And all I'd be thinking about is getting to Friday, going out for drinks on Friday. And, you know, people say this type of thing a lot, but it, it, it's so true with me. I would go out on a Friday and I would not come home till Sunday. It mm -hmm. was, so when I say like, I didn't want to go home, I didn't ever go home. Mm -hmm. So I'd go to the club, I'd go to after parties. Sometimes it had result in me drinking at home by myself. Mm -hmm. And it got really, um, it got really dark. It got really heavy on my mental health. And um, I struggled with anxiety and depression throughout my entire life and since what age would you say as long as i can remember, remember yeah. as long as i can remember my childhood was really dysfunctional mm -hmm. it was really difficult my mum and dad separated when i was eight mm -hmm. um unfortunately my mum got into a life and a cycle that was not particularly healthy mm -hmm. she ended up getting into a relationship with a drug user and um from there she got into using drugs and, and drinking quite heavily herself mm -hmm. and which was really strange for my mum because when she was with my dad and when she had me and my sister alcohol wasn't really part of her life but my mum and dad were high school sweethearts and they got together when they were like 16 my mum had me when she was 16 Aww. and I think what happened was when she broke up with my dad in her early 20s she wanted to go live like a youth that yeah. she never had kind of thing, yeah. but it got really out of hand and um, there was domestic violence at home. There were a lot of struggles and we spent a lot of time, life just became very unstable. Mm -hmm. And um, we lived in multiple times, we had to live in refuge for women and children. And oh. um, I've lived in houses where we, we had a panic button in our house in case one of my mum's ex-partners would turn up. Wow. We had to press the button for the police to come. And it, the reason for talking about that is because um, I'm quite an anxious person now. <laughs> and I think a lot of that comes from having a really anxious childhood yeah. where I was just constantly worried about stuff. And when I say oh, I was a bit of a party boy, speaking honestly, I think that's a smoke screen for me using alcohol and drugs as a way of escape 
escape yeah it was escapism mm -hmm. and the reason why I wasn't able to stop has nothing to do with the fact that I liked alcohol or mm -hmm. I liked the taste of the drink in the glass it's because in my mind I wanted to find complete oblivion mm. I didn't want to be in my mind mm. um, so yeah it got but I didn't know a lot of that stuff at the time mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. when you're in the thick of it um, yeah I guess you don't know why you're doing it um, so and you bounce from weekend to weekend, really. Would you yeah. drink in the week as well? So you say you were living for Friday. So what would that look like? Was that like wine at home or vodka at home or yeah. what time of day? It was me waiting for the co-op to open at 7 a.m. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, yeah. So my last couple of years of drinking were, I always, it's funny because I'd, I'd say to myself, oh, I haven't got a problem with alcohol. Mm. Like I don't drink in the day or I don't drink mm. every day. Like. You have these little sayings that are ways of convincing yourself that there's not a problem and, and it's masking a massive problem. But eventually I was doing those mm -hmm. things and I would, there'd be, you know, sometimes I'd sit up drinking all night and I'd run out. So then I'd be waiting for the co-op to open. And I was so in denial as well because I still had like quite a bit of ego attached to covering up what I was really doing. Yeah. And so when I'd go to the co-op and I can smile about this now, you're probably thinking, why is he smiling about this? But it'd be seven in the morning yeah. and I'd go in and I'd buy like expensive bottles of red wine because in my head that would look better than me going in and buying like a bottle of vodka. Almost like you're going to a dinner party that evening, so you're just like getting organised and buying the red wine. Holly. <laughs> How did I know that? That was bad about me. But yeah. I, that, th but that's what I used yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can remember times when I've obviously been conscious of it when the yeah, person yeah. serving me at the checkout and I said things like, oh yeah, I've got a dinner party tonight, so I'm just planning for that. Yeah, or, yeah. So just like constantly yeah. like living a life. So you knew, but I think it's that we all have that very old fashioned association with an alcoholic. And yeah, I think there's also yeah. different stream, uh, you know, levels of what you deem alcoholism. I think it's any kind of reliance, Yeah. you know, yeah. isn't it? The Janet Hadley's episode in, in her going, you know, um, hers was very much nighttime drinking, but it was like, three bottles of wine a night and mm. like waking up and thinking, oh my God, like, you know, mm. I've got another hangover type of thing. So, mm. so this, like this escalation all the while you're holding down a job. On and off. Right. Okay. Yeah. On yeah. and off. Yeah. Um, so the tipping point was uh, the pandemic COVID-19. Yeah. So I was in and out of work. My mental health was in tatters mm. because we all got sent home to work. Yeah that was like rocket fuel to my addiction <laughs> because it meant I could drink whilst I was working. Yeah. Um, and so I'd be, I was in quite a senior role. Was it HR you were HR, in? HR, yeah, yeah. yeah, I was in HR and I was responsible for a team and I was part of a leadership team and I'd be sat doing meetings, but I'd be drinking throughout the day. And it'd get to the point where like, I've always been able to hold my booze because obviously yeah. I drank a lot, but I've got experiences that make my toes curl because I can think of times when I've been chaotic in that environment. Really? And I, you know, I've no idea if people know. I remember one time, um, it was during lockdown and uh, Gaga released a new album and she released <laughs> the lead song off it, Stupid Love. I'm a big Gaga yeah. fan. And um, on like the team Slack channel, which like all employees are in Slack yeah. and it's where the company oh, like no. announces company information. I'm posting like links for people to stream Stupid Love by Lady Gaga. And it's like, I was the head of HR for God's <laughs> sake. You know, I should be sending out like formal company comms. Is everyone okay during the pandemic? But could you have you listened to Gaga? <laughs> Carl's not okay. Like I'm not okay. Um, so yeah, you know, there are some funny stories, yeah, but the, it, it. I ended up losing that job. Mm -hmm. And did they cite alcohol as a, a problem? Did they identify it or brush it under the carpet or? No, it was my mental health and oh, it was okay. the fact that I was in and out of work. So yeah. that's how the conversation started. At that point, I wasn't speaking to anyone about alcohol yeah. being a problem. Do you think they did know? Yeah, mm. yeah, I do, I do. I, I don't know, I still have a bit of fear around it's such an uncomfortable thing, yeah, like yeah, in a yeah. workplace setting, in a professional setting. Yeah. And I think actually it, it's so important for workplaces to start to talk more about this yeah. because 
there are people in work right now who are suffering with addiction issues, who've got no one to talk to, and work actually might be a bit of escapism, mm. but it, it it's a really important conversation that's just a very difficult mm. one to get right and a difficult one to mm. have. Um, I suspect they knew. Yeah. I suspect they knew. Yeah. Um, so I ended up losing my job and... Yeah, that's when it, everything just kind of spiralled. And I went into um, the last half of 2020, so the first year of the pandemic, mm. where I was just at home constantly drinking and taking drugs. And mm. um, I wasn't paying my rent. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any money. Uh, I wasn't showering. I wasn't eating. It. My apartment was a mess. It was everything that I'd said would never happened to me it was happening and I wasn't connected to any of my friends I wasn't speaking to anyone and you know I got there were two things that were the turning point I reached out in crisis I was feeling suicidal and I reached out in crisis to um, a charity called the LGBT foundation mm -hmm. and they gave me some like immediate crisis support but they said okay will give you some counselling So sessions. you knew at that point, you were yeah. like, this is got, yeah. That was the first time I'd admitted it. I'd gone onto their website and they had a section for substance misuse and it, I, I spent so much time Googling, am I an alcoholic? What does an alcoholic do? Like all of this stuff. And honestly, I think if you're asking Google that question, you're an alcoholic, <laughs> right? You don't need to read through any of the things that come up. It, if you're Googling it, there's probably a problem. Yeah. Um, because I'd find myself reading things and looking for the, say an article would have 10 things that an alcoholic yeah. does in it. If I didn't do one of those things, <laughs> that would be enough. You'd convince yourself. Oh, I'm it? not an alcoholic yeah. because I don't do that one thing. Yeah. But the other nine things I do every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. crazy. It's like your mind playing tricks on you. And it's denial and it's because you don't want to. There's a lot of shame attached to it. I think with anything, that. when you get to the absolute worst point, the thought of getting better is terrifying because you know that whatever work there is to be done is mm. going to be a hell of a lot harder than just having another drink yeah. at that point yeah. because you know and you know there's all this you know we've seen it in the, in the movies haven't we cold turkey and how horrendous it is and you know what was that film train spotting you know, all that kind of thing yeah, like yeah. you know it's going to be horrendous so you've yeah. got to get to the point where the the point of staying the same yeah. is is worse than the work to come so i guess that was the point that you you found yourself yeah at. and also it exactly that and you just can't imagine your life without it. Mm. it you know, I just mm. couldn't imagine a different life. And yeah. I didn't think I had that in me. And I, at this point, it, I didn't really want a life. And, you know, I don't say that uh, lightheartedly. Like, I used to fantasize about not waking up the next day, which is, mm. looking back now, saying that, it's horrendous. Mm. Like, and I feel really sad for that person yeah. that that's how I felt every day um so then I got this help from um a counselor and and basically I had to show that I could try and reduce my consumption yeah um but I wasn't allowed to stop drinking because it would have been unsafe for me to do so so I was seeing an alcohol nurse and I was having some blood tests and yeah um Within like the same week, I, I lose track of time a little bit, but I had two like really hard hitting conversations and one of them was with the alcohol nurse and she rang me and she was like, um, usually these appointments are in person, but because of COVID yeah. everything was over the phone and so I'd had to send some bloods in and um, she just said, look, I've been doing this job a long time and for someone who's 36, you're really poorly and if you keep drinking the way that you're drinking, you're going to die. Your parents will come to your funeral before you're 40. And um, yeah, she said, and she said, I'm not just saying this. You probably think I'm saying this because of my job. And she said, I'm not, it, it's bad. Um, and that was just really, it was quite ironic in that, in my head, I fantasized about not being here anymore. But the then reality. the moment someone told me that actually there's a reality in that fairly soon, I knew that I didn't want to die. I yeah. knew that I didn't want to upset my family. Yeah. And 
at the time it was more about if i'm completely honest the impact on other people than myself it wasn't necessarily i was desperate to have a long like happy healthy life i couldn't imagine like the impact that that would have on my mum for example and you know my sisters and i've got nieces and nephews like what would be said um and it was that was enough to to make me notice mm. essentially um and then within like a similar time span, one of my friends, my best friend, Anna, she would check in with me and she'd text and say mm -hmm. like, you know, just checking in. And she was really good in that. She always knew not to say things like, how are you or are you mm -hmm. okay? And that type of thing. She'd just be like, I'm here if you need yeah, me, yeah, you yeah. know where I am. Um, and she, um, we spoke one day and um, she said to me, Cow, I am terrified every time the, my phone rings. I think it's going to the police, be the police saying that they found your body in your apartment. That's how worried I am about you. And I just couldn't believe that she was having to go through that because of my behavior, mm -hmm. because of what I was doing. And although I understand addiction now and that it, I do say, look, that wasn't me. Yeah. That was a, a problem and a disease that yeah. I'd not addressed, but I obviously still felt really yeah, responsible yeah, yeah. for making her yeah. feel like that. And, um, you know, the fact that my best mate is waiting for the police to ring her yeah. to say, we found your friend. Yeah. Um, and those two conversations happened so close together and it was enough to make me go, okay, I need to do something about wow. this. Um, and from there, I got referred into treatment and I went to outpatient rehab. And um, yeah, it, it, to be honest, even when I was in rehab, I don't think I'd fully admitted my problem. Yeah. Because <laughs> the facilitator, the guy who was leading the groups, he'd use the word alcoholic and I'd like shudder. <laughs> and he'd be like, and he'd point at me and he'd go, but you're an alcoholic, you're in rehab. And I'd be like, I don't think Me? so. <laughs> I buy wine for dinner parties. But back to your point, like, there's so much, like, there are so many perceptions of what an alcoholic looks yeah. like, right? And um, I go to Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm in yeah. the fellowship, and I sit in rooms with people that are from all walks of life, everyday life, and, you know, it, I think it's really important that conversations like this highlight the fact that you know alcoholism is something that can affect anyone yeah. and it is not that uh, typical and not even to talk negatively about a person on the street because I think that's also disrespectful but it there's a lot of perceptions of that mm. being what it is and um so that's why I uh, feel quite comfortable talking about this stuff openly because mm -hmm. I think it's important to break down those perceptions. Yeah. And you, like, you sat before me today. You three, three years is a big achievement, but it's also not that long a time. You look so healthy. Like, yeah. have you? Are you visibly? Do you visibly look different? Oh my god! Really? Oh my god! I look like a different person. <laughs> In what way? I guess your skin. I'm like just fascinated. I your skin. <laughs> no, you must have been like dehydrated and stuff like that, and skinny. And I mean, you no, don't. No, some... interestingly, yeah. I was three stone heavier. Really. But calories in wine, and yeah, you know, yeah. stuff like I was. I drank a lot of wine. Um, uh, yeah, so I was three stone heavier, and I do this thing where I'd binge for days, and then when I'd come out of that binge, I'd spend like two or three days eating so much junk really? because I'd not eaten for days. So your body was craving like sugar and carbs. And yeah, like... high fat food and yeah. all that type of thing. Um, when I show people pictures, they to... actually don't believe it's the same person. Oh. Yeah, I, I'm three stone heavier. Uh, my skin's grey. Um, I haven't got like long hair like this and like, yeah. It, I didn't look after myself. Yeah, I, you know, of course. I, it it yeah. was just... Uh, but I think the main thing is my, like your energy, right? Yeah. Your energy looks like something, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it's funny because at the time people knew something was wrong, but they didn't know how wrong it was. And I've had people that are close to me since say, 
like my sister says it all the time when she looks at old photos now she's like I can't believe I couldn't see it more yeah. because now they see actually what I should look like yeah. as a healthy like yeah. functioning person to a degree um yeah. And, and she'll say things like you were just like your face was just so sad yeah. or like you were dead behind the eyes and my yeah. dad sent me a picture actually last week and it's a picture of us down the pub we're in Weatherspoons yeah. and I actually remember the day and I remember I'd been out the night before and I'd not been to bed which my dad didn't know yeah, of course yeah and um I look gray I look like completely washed out and what's more interesting in the picture is my dad's face because my dad's looking at me as I'm talking and he looks so worried and it's why he sent me the picture he sent me the picture the other day and he yeah. said look how worried i am i was worried oh, sick wow. about you wow so, yeah i look and i'm like a, a sober cliche now because <laughs> i'm obsessed with fitness yes! i eat well yeah. you know i exercise every single day i do breath work i do cold water dips <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah i do all of this stuff so yeah. now i'm like I've gone so far beyond yeah. what I was and now I'm like tapping into all of these things that make me feel naturally yeah. great. And if you have got a bit, so I've got a bit of an, I wouldn't say addictive personality, but obsessive personality. I like people say to me, oh, you exercise too much. You know, you should, you need downtime on the sofa and all that. And I'd be like, yeah, but I'd be more anxious if I didn't get my run done or whatever. And I always think, oh, well, there's worse things I could be addicted to. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. So, well, so... We'll come back to kind of the wellness side of it and how you're feeling now and all that, which is fascinating. Yeah. But so you were in HR, corporate job. Yeah. So you got well, let's say 21. Yeah, that's right. Early 21, was it? January Actually. 2021. Well, yeah. yeah. That's when I went and so treatment. when, talk us through that change and like, then when did you get another job in HR and when did you start it start to not be... A co well, a conscious decision every day. Like, what was that yeah, like the next yeah. stage? So I came out of treatment. I did two rounds of treatment and I came out of the second one in June 2021. Yeah. And so I'd been sober six months at that point. Yeah. And um, it was, at that point, it was still a daily struggle for yeah. me. I still thought about alcohol yeah. every day. I couldn't possibly like comprehend like a holiday without drinking yeah, yeah yeah the summer was just arriving like being in manchester and mm -hmm. you know not sitting outside and drinking like all of these things i just couldn't get my head yeah. around it um but i had six months behind me so i had a decent amount of like sobriety behind yeah. me so i got a new job um it was another like head of hr job it was in a technology company and at that point in time my mindset was I've never really given my all professionally mm -hmm. because I've always been so distracted by drinking. I want to make a thing of my HR mm -hmm. career. So I had no plans to do anything different at yeah. that point. And, um, and shock horror, it turns out when I'm not distracted by drinking, I'm really good at my yeah. job. <laughs> and I go to work every day and I'm like happy and I'm positive and like I do the things that I say yeah. I'm going to do. Because a lot of it was that for me in drinking. I just wouldn't show up, not yeah. just for myself, but for other people. And I wouldn't do the things that I yeah. would say I was going to do. And it's almost like, I, sometimes I, I describe or like an uh, addiction to like, it's just like a massive loss of potential. Mm -hmm. You know, we've all got so much potential within us. And if we've got an addiction, whether it is a substance or a, a behavior, whatever that thing is, it's really distracting. Mm -hmm. And it takes you away from actually what you're meant to be doing with mm -hmm. your life. So got back into HR loving life yeah. I'm like you know it I had a lot of debt that I needed to pay yeah. off um I'd racked up a huge amount of like credit cards yeah. and loans and things like that um so I, I was happy in that and I did that for a few years and I think then just realized that this sounds like really altruistic but there's more to life than doing HR and, you know, rocking up to these companies that are making lots of money and, you know, it... Wasn't fulfilling you. In the, it wasn't yeah. fulfilling me. And um, I definitely have a tendency to get a bit existential and, you know, I get a bit philosophical and I'm like, you know, what is life? What me is it too. all about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just very quickly realised that that's just not what I wanted to do when I'd grown up kind of thing. Do you think um, a bit, sorry to cut back, do you think a little bit, only because I think of when I recovered from OCD and the way I describe it is the blinkers came off and mm. it was almost like, 
well, if I can do it, that's literally where anything is possible came mm. from. If I can do that, I can do anything. Because if you think of how you've had to use your brain to overcome addiction, there's mm. nothing else that's done that, it's your brain. Mm. So actually, to me, your brain is so strong and obviously so powerful. I don't know if that had anything to do with that. I didn't like, well, I've done that now. It's almost like when you've been through something that traumatic 100%. and you've got all them traumatic memories, it's like, well, actually nothing's, I'm not yeah. scared anymore. Yeah. It's it, actually, did, did that, does that resonate for 100%. you? hundred yeah. percent. It's yeah. like you get this superpower. <laughs> it's like rocket fuel yeah. and you get like muscle memory from it. And it's like, I didn't realise at the time because you're just so caught up in the day to day. But then like mm. when I got a year behind me and then when I got two years behind me and I'm like, do you know what? I've gone from going to the co-op at seven o'clock every morning to get my wine. Yeah. To I haven't had a drink since I put it down. Mm. You know, luckily relapse is not part of my story. You do just build up some self-confidence mm. with mm. that. And then... I was struggling a bit in work and I was going from meeting to meeting and I was sitting in these meetings in boardrooms and it was making me depressed again. Yeah. And the depression that I was starting to feel was quite triggering because I could almost liken it to when I was in my addiction. And that really frightened oh me. Oh my God, yeah, that makes so much sense. Because then it's like, hang on a minute, it, you know, is there a risk of relapse for yeah, me? Because yeah. the job's going to push me into it. Yeah. You know, it, I think you become so much more self-aware yeah. of what's happening in your life. And so, yeah, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Oh. I don't want to work in HR. I don't want to make other people rich. And I quit my job. <laughs> I, Without a plan. That's Without literally a plan. what I did. That's Is it? A, honestly, it was literally like... I'm not going to do this anymore. It's a totally different story. Like, I'm not going to be a yes girl. I've been through that. I quit my job with nothing to go to. Yeah. And it was quite, like... Quick. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, wow. Right. So you just quit your job. So I quit my job. And was love from, like, even on... I know it wasn't called no. that, but it wasn't on the cards. It was just, no. I need to protect myself. It like. didn't exist, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'd started my podcast, What Next? And that was just a little bit of, like, dipping my toe in the water. Yeah. And... That was never something that I thought, oh, I'm going to make a career out of this because, you know, that's quite hard to do with the podcast. Yeah. And it was like, it, it was just a nice little scratch in the itch of yeah. doing something that felt meaningful for me. Yeah. Um, so I quit my job and I'd been really burnt out. I was really overworked, had a really demanding job. So I went away, I, I had like a couple of bougie holidays and I went on a yoga retreat and then I went to Croatia and like did all of these things and just got some headspace. And it was my friend, Anna, who said to me, actually, Anna, who'd friend, had that very difficult yeah. conversation with, she would pointed out to me that I'd never really thought about before that from the moment of stopping drinking and going into treatment, I finished treatment on the Friday and I started this head of HR job the following Monday, yeah. way back when. I'd not had a minute, I'd no. not stopped. I'd been constantly on the hamster wheel with my recovery, with job, with paying off my debt, with getting into fitness, with losing weight, all of these things. It was like the next thing, the next thing, the next leather. thing. Yeah, and in my head, I was definitely going through and like ticking off a list of things that I needed to fix and sort yeah. out. And yeah. I actually think that is, that's a, a little bit unhealthy because you're not living in the present. You're constantly thinking about, okay, well, what's the next goal? Yeah. What's the next goal? And it's really important to have goals to be motivated yeah. towards, right? But also just enjoy where you are. Yeah. Um, so I went on these holidays and then I was like, I'm going to open an alcohol-free bar. <laughs> and was this like lying in the sun when this idea came to you? Or? So I'd had the idea before the yoga retreat and then I'd mentioned it to a few people and people were interested and I started to have meetings and then I pitched to um, campus, which is where yeah. the pop-up is at Wait, now. wait, so when you pitched, did you have a pitch deck? Did you, so yeah. how did you, sorry, because we have like loads of people that want to start their own okay. um, thing. So like, how did you know how to do a pitch deck? Like what was in it? Yeah, so, okay, let's rewind a bit. 
I'm quite lucky in that my job that I did, yeah. I would have to write presentations right. all the time. Yeah, yeah. So I would often be often be going into like meetings with leadership teams yeah. and with the board and stuff like that and presenting an idea, right. usually for like a new HR system or like a strategy or something. Yeah. So I had quite a lot of experience in so you applied that presenting to, yeah. information. Yeah. And so um, I'm not saying I'm amazing at it, but I kind of yeah, know the, what yeah, you need yeah. to do um, in terms of how to tell the story and so um i was introduced to campus through someone that i know that worked there through someone that i met actually in the fitness world yeah. um doing like a boot camp class yeah. um classic and she was like oh why don't you like come and meet the campus team and yeah. pitch your idea to them so i wrote a pitch deck so i wrote a presentation <sighs> which was um what's my business idea yeah um, how would I run like a pop-up alcohol-free bar? Yeah. Like what's the audience that I'm appealing to? Yeah. So the kind of things that you would include in a business plan, yeah. essentially, like what would my marketing strategy be? Yeah. All this type of stuff. And I just use chat GPT for a lot of <laughs> the like prompts, you know, in terms of just yeah. saying, okay, what shall I put into my pitch deck? Like, and then yeah. when it asks, so it talked about marketing. I'm not a marketing expert. So yeah. I was like, okay, what marketing ideas should I use? And yeah. so I had some ideas myself, but it was helpful to just validate. So, yeah, to yeah. structure it, to yeah. structure it. Um, Pitch to campus and they were like, yeah, we love it. And just for those people outside of Manchester, explain what campus is. Campus is a new development in Manchester City Centre. Mm. It's a residential development, but it's got um, a, a commercial and element with space. yeah, lots of retail and leisure. And so bars, restaurants, shops, etc. Yeah. And it's all in a little community in some gorgeous gardens. Yeah. And so... It's the perfect spot yeah. for what I wanted to do. And it's yeah. super central. And yeah. essentially, they've got a, one of their commercial units. They only use it for pop-ups. Oh. And so they were like, we've got a gap in between some of our tenants. Do you want to go in for a couple of weeks? So it was last October. And um, it was just perfect. Because I was like, yeah, sober October. We can position oh, yeah, it all around sober yeah. October. And, and also, it, was, it wasn't just about me testing it with... Uh, the Manchester market and seeing if people would yeah. come. Obviously, that was the main thing. But I needed to test it for myself yeah. because I'd worked in offices for like the last 15 years of my career. And I'm like, hang on a minute. You know, I get up at five o'clock in the morning. I'm in bed for 9 p.m. Yeah. since I've got sober. And yeah. do I really want to run a bar? You know, that's yeah. going to completely disrupt all of that. And yeah. I've never run a bar. I've worked in a bar, but I've never run yeah. one. So it was a test for the business, but it was a test for me. Yeah. Um, Luckily, it went brilliantly. Yeah, and yeah. after that initial two-week pop-up, I was like, yeah, this is amazing and yeah. it's definitely what I want to do. Yeah. Um, so they invited me to pitch again for a longer-term residency, yeah. which is for three months. Yeah. That's the residency that I'm in now. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm doing a three-month residency. It's just been extended, actually, so it's going to be four months. Yeah, so that'll take you to when? Till the end of April. Yeah. Um, But then it's just grown arms and legs because yeah. everyone is... People are really curious around this topic. Yeah. And I don't necessarily mean um, sober curious, but yeah. people are just curious around drinking less or yeah. going out and not drinking. Yeah. So we get a lot of people that come in that don't drink like me that yeah. are, we get people that are in recovery like me we get people that have just chosen to be sober yeah. so they've not had addiction issues we get people that are curious um we get people that say they're sober ish yeah so they don't drink that often but every now and then yeah. they might have a drink and then we get people that do drink and they just want to do something different yeah, and enjoy. so yeah. we get a real mix yeah, of people yeah, yeah. Um, and so we've had a lot of interest we've had a lot of press coverage and we've got the bar but we started to do events so we're doing like yeah. corporate events now and um, we're doing festivals so we've yeah. got festivals coming up this summer and so at the moment it's just me and um, I've recently like I've got people like on the bar yeah, obviously running yeah. the bar but I recently had to just hire someone to help me with yeah. events and planning yeah. and stuff like yeah. that because it's really blown up and yeah. people are like really keen to either host an event or for us to attend an event yeah. that they're at and yeah there's a it's been a massive success so far so I'm always like super keen on like the business side of things so yeah. with and please only answer questions that you're comfortable with but so with pitching to Canvas do they give you a rental period for free or do you have was there investment up front like how does that all work so the space is essentially um 
it's almost like an incubator space for yeah. new businesses. So oh, cool. there are some businesses in Manchester that started out in yeah. that unit. So yeah. there's a restaurant called Higher Ground, which yes. is really successful. Yeah. Yeah. Higher Ground started out in the bungalow. It's called, yeah. The unit's called the bungalow. Yeah. So um, it's subsidised, essentially. Yeah. Um, obviously, there are still things like utilities and, yeah. and that type of thing to cover. But... Um, yeah, I haven't had to pay rent, which has given me the opportunity Amazing. to spend money what I would have spent on rent yeah. on things like, um, you know, setting my branding up, investing yeah. in like marketing and, and all that type of thing. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And what about the kit? Did you do the whole kit out and everything as well? No, it's kitted out. Oh, it's amazing. kitted out. So it comes with a bar that has got all of the electrical equipment that yeah. you need, glass washers, uh, all of that type of thing. I've essentially had to buy... All the things to all make it look nice. All yeah. the bits, yeah. So the furniture's in there. I've put in, like, nice table settings. There's artwork on the walls. Yeah. Um, all of the glassware. Yeah. I bought my own glassware. Yeah. Because I think part of having a grown-up non-alc drink is having it in a nice yeah, bloody absolutely. glass. absolutely. You know, when yeah. you go somewhere and, you know, the, there isn't a non-alc menu yeah. or you have to have a soft drink and... You have it in like half a lager style glass or whatever, yeah. and it just it doesn't encourage people. It makes people, such does it? a difference. Like I, I've really cut down my drinking, and just at the weekend, like if we're watching a film, I might just have like a sparkling type of a drink. As long as it's in a nice wine glass, it kind of yeah. ticks the box for me. It's like I just want to hold the glass, and you know, yeah, definitely. It's part of the experience, yeah, of course, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, I bought nice glasses, and then equipment to run the bar and everything yeah. so it i've had quite a lot of startup costs and had i been paying like high rent and rates and yeah, all of yeah. those things as well it you know it i just wouldn't have been able to, yeah. to do that without yeah. borrowing money essentially yeah, so yeah. i'm quite lucky in that so far i haven't had to borrow any money it's been self-funded um but i'm looking for a permanent space and obviously that yeah does cost yeah, quite a yeah, lot of yeah, money yeah. so that's the next thing basically. and i guess for campus though like they're ticking a lot of boxes in terms of they're providing something that is a very much on trend but be really good for manchester's wellness yeah especially with like at the rate of our homelessness and and things like that like so actually for them it's probably a really good combination so as much as you're they're doing for you you're doing for them i would imagine yeah and they're because of the nature of how they're set up they are about community yeah that's how they run their residential yeah that, and honestly, it, campus and the team at campus, I'm not just saying this, mm. it, they've been incredible. Yeah. They've given me so much support with events, with like getting the word out there, with um, offering to roll up the sleeves and they're like, right, what do you need? We'll yeah. come down and we'll help you set up. Yeah. So it's been really nice because I've been doing it alone. They've almost been like an extended team. Yeah. And I think like thinking about this from a you know you wanting to talk about the business side of things it when you start up a new business as a solo founder it's really hard and you can feel really lonely and yeah. really isolated and it can definitely get really overwhelming because it feels like there's so much to do and you have to do everything yeah. you know i can go from like being on a podcast to having a meeting about investment to yeah. um, taking the bins out yeah. and, you know, worrying about ordering citrus fruit for yeah. like the fresh juices tonight. Yeah. It, it's everything. And what is has been really nice working with campus is I've had like an extended team of people yeah. that have been able to help me yeah. with that stuff. Yeah, amazing. And so you've, this, you talk about like the skills and everything. I mean, you've you've created a brand, you've opened a bar, um, you've got this amazing events calendar with yeah. like comedy, open mic, drag, everything, like literally yeah. everything. The menu, which I'm gonna to come to in a minute, like, and you've come, obviously had the corporate background, but what does a typical week look for you now? Are, have you, like, are you working 12 hours a day? Do you flip from thing to thing? Are you organized? Like what, tell us what oh your life God, is like now. Oh God, this is where the chaos comes out. <laughs> that won't change. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so not to be um, encouraging of this type of Hustle. way of working <laughs> yeah but I'm working every day at the moment yeah. and although yesterday I did take a day off yeah and I took myself off to climb a big hill and oh, just amazing. get yeah I got home and I did some email and whatnot yeah, but yeah. it's really different when it's your baby and when it's your own thing it, it's 
you know, I'm not doing that because I feel stressed like I need to do the work. I'm yeah. doing it because I want Enjoy. to do it. Yeah, yeah. And it was, I'd had an email come in yesterday from the Manchester Evening News and there's an article coming out around drinking within the LGBTQ plus community yeah. and how binge drinking rates are higher. There's a, a piece of research that's yeah. been done and, you know, you can't take a day off when you get an email and then it says, oh, would you like to comment on that? Because as an LGBTQ mm -hmm. plus person and as someone that had a drink problem, like I absolutely want yeah. to comment on that. Yeah. So my days are so varied. Yeah. But yeah, there's running the bar. Yeah. So there's all of the operations of the bar yeah. and the team and supporting yeah. the team. There's the event side of things in terms of we want to run a lot of events at the bar because I think that really amplifies the experience. I would you agree. Can come and have yeah. a great drink, but also if there's a quiz night or an open mic night, we're appealing to lots of different people and it, it's giving people more of a reason to maybe not go to the pub yeah. and to come to our place, for example. Yeah. Events management is, I take <laughs> my hat off to you. It is wild. Isn't it? Oh my God. Just. <laughs> Like just coordinating diaries and like when you've got multiple people involved yeah. and getting things booked in and logistics and it's so much. Oh, yeah, I know. Why it's do we lot. do it to ourselves? Honestly? Yeah, so I feel you on that. So there's all the event side of things. Social media. Yeah. Full time do do job. All that? I do all yeah. of that. Full time job. And because of the nature of what we do, I'm running... Um, Love From is more than a venue. Yeah. You know, I always say to people, it's more than a drink in a glass. It's yeah. more than a night out. We are a brand and a movement and we're here to like inspire and to hopefully motivate people, right? Um, and that's why our motto is cutting out isn't missing out. Yeah. And so I talk about that stuff quite a lot on socials and I've actually had feedback from some of our followers to say, there's not much content of the bar on your socials. Yeah. Like it's a lot of you talking. So I'm trying to still like figure out Oh, it's balance. hard. You never it, get it right. It's really hard. Yeah. Um, but yeah, running socials, we because of the nature of what we do, I get a lot of messages from people that are um, on their own journey. Yeah. Um, I get messages from people that are struggling or messages from people that know someone that's mm. struggling and people wanting advice and um, uh, that type of thing. And also just sometimes people just sending really lovely messages mm. saying, oh, we love what mm. you're doing. Um, but it... It's obviously really important for me to respond to all of that mm -hmm. stuff, but it just takes up a lot of time yeah. to respond to it. And also there's a there's a bit of a line with actually, what is it, my responsibility in appropriate for me to respond to versus like where people might need to be signposted to get yeah. help from a professional because yeah. I'm not a medical professional. Um, so there's managing all of that. And then there's a business to run. So like finance yeah. and accounting and like, yeah, everything else. And then there's stuff that you just don't plan for. Yeah. So that's all like the running of the business and building the brand. And then something will happen in a day where you're like, <laughs> oh, right, that's my day today yeah. then. The pipes have frozen. There's no running water. Yeah. And we're a cocktail bar that needs yeah. running water yeah. constantly, essentially, yeah. to rinse all of the equipment. And so there's a lot of... Um, like thinking on your theme, yeah. reactive stuff, yeah. Yeah, and so what, so say for me, um, and, I, and I've talked about this a bit on the podcast, like I've definitely cut down drinking because running a business for as long as I have, like it was easy for that go-to to be a glass of wine after work and I definitely wanted to cut that out. So what is your stress go-to now if it's not, a run. A run. Yeah, a yeah, run. yeah. I yeah. totally get Without and hesitation. Are you long distance, short distance? Oh my God, it's wild. It depends on my mood. Yeah. So I can go out and do 5K or I can go out and do like a half marathon. <laughs> oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a humble brag, but running is yeah, it's amazing. Uh, game changing. Because it gives you, it gives you that high. Yeah. That it's like you don't want to do it. But you never feel bad after a run. I do never. You? I feel yeah. incredible after every yeah. run, and um, it's where I always listen to music when I run, so yeah. I can really get out of zone my out. head yeah. and like zone out. And yeah, just the exercise makes me feel yeah. good. Yeah. And like I feel if I have a day where I don't do exercise, yeah. I don't feel right. I'm like I'm exactly, I have like a, rep, a sort of a planned rest day a week, but actually on Sunday I was really tired, but I needed to work, and I'd like convinced myself I was not going to train, and then I was like, do you know what? I just need to get outside, even mm. if I do a slow five k. Then I did a ten k, and I was like, oh, 
oh wow nice. how did that but I, I felt and you know people and I'm sure they say it to you they'll say wouldn't you just sit on the sofa and watch Netflix and I was like yeah I would yeah but equally that makes me feel like good the movement yeah. the fresh air yeah. and everything a hundred percent it really does nature yeah. so my go-to's now are running yeah nature so yesterday I went and just climbed up a big hill on your own yeah went Amazing. by myself because I spend a lot of time around people now, yeah. and so I really just value my own like. And you need time. to, don't you? Because yeah. I guess you've, as part of your ongoing sobriety, you've got to be comfortable with yourself and your own thoughts, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. And I can feel twitchy if I don't have time to myself. Yeah. My big thing's journaling. Yeah, and if nice. I've not journaled, and I have to have really clear space to do that, I'm not one of these people, I'll do 15 minutes in the morning, like I need to know I've got a half day, yeah. that I've just got time. and. I can feel myself feeling off when I don't do when those do go-to things. Yeah. Do you have that? Yeah, so I try to, I journaling I've got like a bit of a hit and miss relationship yeah. with. And it, I think it. I go through periods of like doing it all the time yeah. and then I'll have like a big chunk of time off. Yeah. I think it depends what's going on yeah. for me and what needs yeah. to come out. But then I also will have periods where I'm not like this, like altruistic like health conscious doing everything yeah. like right like by yeah. the book like i'll have periods where the thing that makes me feel better is comfort eating yeah and i'll eat like not great food yeah. and i've got quite a sweet tooth yeah, and i went through a crazy addiction with maltesers recently <laughs> that um, i'm glad to say i'm over but i was getting through like a share bag a night um, that's not too bad it's not too bad i guess no. uh, there are worse things um but yeah, sometimes I can just, because it's quite tiring, like being a founder, right? Yeah. And running a business. Yeah. And sometimes actually with the best will in the world, getting out for a run is actually going to just make me more physically tired. Yeah. And so sometimes, uh, to your point earlier, I it do just sit Netflix. and watch Netflix yeah. and eat Maltesers. And... But you've got to do that as well, haven't yeah. you? You've got, it's got to be that that mix. Balance. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to just read you oh. a couple of my favourite, which I believe are some of your top sellers on the menu. So if you go to Love From, yeah. you've got a full drinks menu. You yeah. can also order pizza from a neighbouring From Nell's Pizzeria. Pizza, yeah. yeah. And you have all this entertainment, which is amazing. So I was looking through, and guys, I have to read you this. So we've got an espresso yourself, mm. which is sweet molasses. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Um, ginger coffee, sumptuous with a kick, with... Myth dark spiced good coffee, saffron, cold brew, and sea salt. Mm. That sounds amazing. Delicious. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that is a top seller. Yeah. It's our second popular most drink. Yeah. So when we did the pop up in October, yeah. we didn't have uh, an alcohol free espresso martini. Yeah. And then before we started this new pop up, I did a little survey, I just put out on Insta stories what drinks do you want to see on the menu? Yeah. Oh my God, it was, I had hundreds of responses. For espresso martini. Espresso martini, espresso martini, espresso martini. Yeah. It's really difficult to yeah. do alcohol free. And yeah. we, we don't have a coffee machine either in the venue. Oh. Um, so like just finding the right products to yeah. make it. Uh, but it is banging. We have so many people that say, that's better than a normal espresso martini. Oh, it sounds delicious. Yeah, yeah, what great. about, do you have an alternative for Aperol? Because that's one of my faves. Yeah, so we use an Italian aperitif, um, a spirit called Wilfrid's, yeah. um, which is delicious. Yeah. And we do that in a drink called I'm Italian, Don't You Know, which is oh, a Lady okay. Gaga reference. Naturally. Um, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we do that. Oh, uh, that sounds amazing. Yeah, with some soda, topped up with some naughty sparkling Chardonnay with a big wedge of orange in there in a big like wine glass with ice yeah that's really popular and then your other one mm. that i need to mention is the manchester tart yeah bold and full of heart like manchester cross hip no cross hip hibiscus yeah with dark spice lemon cherry cherry is my favorite mm. vanilla is my favorite and mas and i can never say this mascherino maraschino no cherry, cherry. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds insane as well. <laughs> that's our top seller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's our number one drink. And uh, so we do, the menu is mostly cocktail based. Yeah. We do beers and ales and wine and, and other bits and pieces. But um, I checked the other day, actually, 70% of what we um, serve is a cocktail. Yeah. Um, and because we use non-alc spirits in everything, yeah. 
they just taste so much better than what you get typically in, in yeah. other venues. I'm not saying all of other venues do this, but a lot of places just use fruit juice and yeah. syrups, whereas we've got lots of complexity and depth. Yeah. And yeah, the Manchester tart is our like standout <sighs> drink. Sounds, I need to come in for that it's pizza. It's so good. It's so good. And you do a lot of the beers on tap. Is that right? We've got one on tap. So yeah. we've got free dam on tap. So yeah. you can get uh, a nice refreshing cold pint yeah uh, and it's 0.0, 0 as well which is good because often a beer is like 0.5 yeah, yeah, which is yeah. still classed as alcohol free yeah. but you know they have to label it yeah. that, so there's trace in there freedom is not 0.0 uh, yeah. and it's on draft and it is yeah people have been loving that oh, and you have naughty wine spelt n-a-u-g-h-t-y n-o n-o as in naughty oh, yeah, that's yeah. Right, yeah 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 and we've had amanda who is the founder on the podcast nice. if anyone wants to listen to that but that they're really good they're wines so aren't good. they yeah. really really good and i think what's good about their wine is because amanda's a sommelier yeah so she's an expert in and wine. she's not so she is like balanced living isn't she yeah you know, the time yeah. I interviewed her she was like i'm not telling people not to drink and i drink but i want to make the best wine that doesn't have alcohol in it i think that, she has, yeah, yeah yeah i think she has. Yeah. people love it because the most common question we get is people will come up to the bar and they'll go please can you tell me where can i find a good alcohol free yeah. wine and even more specifically people are always like is there a good alcohol free red wine yeah. out there yes um and I, I I always let people, so if anyone comes to the bar and they want to sample something yeah. before they buy it, I let people have a taster. Yeah. So I'll be like, have a taste of this naughty wine. They See what it. you think. Yeah, yeah. everyone yeah. loves it. It's great. Oh, well, I think you've got everything going for you at the bar. So before we sort of finish the podcast, I'd love to know what is next. You've talked about other cities. You've talked about investment. What is the big dream? Like God. if anything was possible. If anything was possible, um, my big dream, my oh, big goal this. is to have a love from yeah. in Ibiza <gasps> and yes. for me to live in Ibiza yes. um, and, yeah, just have a nice, like, life in the sunshine. Yeah. Um, I think love from would work so well in Ibiza because yeah. there's such a scene for, like, alternative things yeah. and um, such an amazing crowd out there because I still love partying yeah. and I still love house music and going out dancing and yeah. you know I go out now and I can stay out till people are like are you sure you're not on something like because yeah. I just go out and I'm having a really good time with the yeah. music I'm there for the right reason now um and so I'd love to have my own place in Ibiza yeah. um the goal for love from I guess that's like more a personal yeah, goal yeah yeah is I'd love us to have multiple places yeah. in different cities, not just in the UK, but like yeah. in other parts of the world. Yeah. I'd love to see us like, you know, we're getting into the festival scene, but oh my God, I'd love to be at Glastonbury. Oh, like, that would just that be That would insane. be amazing. That would be amazing. And what about investment? Do you think we're going to see on Dragon's Den or anything like that? I've not thought about it, but who knows? Oh. I need investment and I'm looking at the moment. So yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe, maybe. The, the next big thing is a permanent space yes. i need to get a permanent space yeah. i need to get the money to be able to do that what we're doing at the moment is setting us up for success because it's helping us to brand prove building. that there's a need for it and yeah. to build the brand yeah yeah and so i'm just going to continue doing what i'm doing because sometimes holly when i like think about some of those big goals like i can get a bit overwhelmed just, with yeah, it. yeah 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 and what i've learned is most days just putting one foot in front of the other and doing like the next best thing yeah it's I'm heading in the right yeah, direction yeah, yeah and even if in a day you're only giving like 30 percent of what you've got like you're still giving something right and it's still like moving you towards whatever is your I've become quite spiritual in yes. my sobriety yeah. and so I like to also just let the universe guide me and give me like little yeah. green lights and I feel like the universe has got me this far it got me sober and so the right path will kind of make yeah, yeah. itself known, if that makes sense. Oh, 100%. How exciting. Um, so we love to end the podcast with um, a question we ask everyone, and this is kind of to inspire a, a mixed audience. So if you had to kind of say, what, how would you encapsulate the phrase, what does anything is possible mean to you? Anything is possible to me it means that you can completely turn your life around even if you are I didn't want to live I didn't want to live 
I couldn't bear the thought of another day of life. Um, for years, I felt like that. And I thought that because I just didn't know there was another path out there. And honestly, you hear people say it gets better and things like that. And it, I could shout it from the rooftops because things can be turned around. Mm -hmm. And so anything is possible for me completely epitomizes that if there's something that is not working for you in your life and it feels too big a mountain to climb just do like one small thing just ask someone for help talk to someone about it just do one tiny thing don't think about the big thing like when I went into treatment my goal wasn't to stay sober forever mm -hmm. I thought I'd be back drinking again by the summer and mm -hmm. I'd be fine you know it that can be too overwhelming. Just do something small for yourself and something little that is gonna move you in the right direction. Uh, and the rest will take care of itself if you just keep doing that. Yeah, you can turn things around. I think that, and I've said this before in the podcast, I think things, I'm quite spiritual. So I think people are given situations in life to deal with because of the good that they're gonna do after. And I think that, you know, you've been through this horrific, you know, the first potentially three decades of your life where it has been pretty horrific. Mm. But yet, you know, you've turned it around and, and kind of by the numbers guessing you're still in your like, sort of in your 30s, you've, you've got so much time ahead of you, yet such an amazing platform to inspire others. And I think that, yes, you get a million messages, but there'll also be double that with people that won't be brave enough to message you, mm, that you'll be true. really, 100%, that you'll really be inspiring you don't know how many people are walking in the bar that have never messaged you, but are purposely going into the bar because they've seen your story. So, and, I, and I'm guessing, and, I'm, and I might be wrong, but just from my own experiences, it's putting your stamp on the world with love from to say, I'm sober and I'm kicking, I'm kicking the ass out of it. You've kind of got to keep going now because mm. you've promised outwardly. <laughs> but, but I think that with anything, it's possible. It's like anytime I have a tiny, you know, and I will say I'm OCD free, but I, I'm mindful of it. I have to watch it and I might get a, like a little, you know, and I feel like there's a little nerve going off and it's like, mm. but I can't go back. Mm. I can't fall back because I've promised everybody <laughs> anything is possible. So, so true. like you're kind of without realizing that is your like, it's your anchor, isn't it as well to like, you know, I'm yeah. gonna do this. Yeah. So I think what you're doing, I mean, not only is it just a really cool, interesting brand and I drink, but I'm excited about your brand and what you're doing. It's also, it's, it's a brilliant brand, it's clever because it's come at just the right time, but it's also helping so many people. So how couldn't you feel fulfilled? And it, and I think what you said is so right, like don't try and overwhelm yourself with it getting too big because if it's meant to be, it will be. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think it will be. Um, thank so you. So thank you for bringing so much sunshine to Manchester oh, and hopefully you. across the UK as, as your journey goes on. And I feel like we've got you quite early on the podcast in your journey, so I feel very privileged. Um, thank, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining me. It's, it's been amazing. It's been gorgeous. Thank <laughs> you.